Dennis Bielon uh, teaches, of course, at York University. Uh, he is undergraduate director there, for which he deserves a lot of credit. It's a very, uh, for a, as large a department as that, a very taxing job, which he has done with uh, great creativity. Um, people probably know, if they don't, they should. Uh, Dennis's very important book, Wrestling with Democracy, Voting Systems in the 20th Century, and it's a survey of class struggles around voting systems over the course of the century in virtually all of the developed advanced capital states. Uh, people will also know his work on voting reform in Canada, both as an activist and as an intellectual, not least his politics uh, of, of voting systems, uh, Canada's electoral system. Dennis, uh, take it over. Thank you, Leo. And uh, let me begin by uh, thanking uh, Greg and Leo for asking me to contribute to uh, this edition of the Register. Uh, it's a great honor to be in the Socialist Register. Uh, I think a real career and uh, intellectual highlight for me. Um, and in many ways, this piece kind of draws together uh, all of the things that I've wanted to talk about. Uh, those of you who know me, uh, you know, might sum up my career as voting systems, voting systems, voting systems. Um, I have other interests. Um, uh, though you might not know it from talking to me. The mic drop, it happened so early in the event. <laughs> Normally it comes later. Um, but, um, thank you. But, uh, yes, this, this piece, I think, really uh, uh, brings to the fore uh, my interest in institutions uh, and voting system, which is really as a way of talking about democracy. And so this... This piece, which actually ended up being not exactly what Leo and Greg asked me to do, um, I ended up kind of going rogue. Uh, but in the end, they liked it, and so that, that's great, and I'm really pleased that they had such a positive response, and Leo, of course, did some fairly Herculean editing on it, um, and so what you see is, is a, a very much a collective product. Um, to introduce my discussion of the chapter, obviously I'm not going to go into all the details. Spoiler alert, I wouldn't want to ruin the ending for you. Um, but I am... I mean, around us is all the stuff we need uh, to sort of get into the topic. I was reading the other day about what's going on in Hungary uh, and the Fidesz uh, government there, um, which has done remarkable uh, 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 institutional change uh, in a period of just a couple of years. The right are utterly ruthless uh, in, in making these sorts of changes. Um, and it reminded me, of course, what was happening for a longer period of time in Poland. Um, with the Law and Justice Party, uh, and of course, if we come closer to home, <coughs> excuse me, closer to home, um, you know, the election of Trump. All of these developments are seen as kind of the rise of what, what are called illiberal uh, democracies, uh, or as Leo mentioned, uh, Colin Crouch's uh, small book on post-democracy, um, or Wendy Brown has talked about the undoing of the demos. There's a, a lot of hand-wringing going on uh, amongst um, various people. Uh, about what is going on in contemporary democracy. And yet, in the piece, I argue that these characterizations are, are wrong. Um, not because our current form of democracy isn't under threat, it certainly is, um, but because critics, I think, misunderstand that democracy. They misunderstand what it is, um, how it works, and how it came to be. And as a result, their solutions to the present crisis will be wrong too. So, my Socialist Register chapter explores these questions. Um, what exactly do we mean by democracy? Where did it come from? What and who facilitated its rise, its introduction, and its reproduction in the 20th century? These, I think, are the questions and answers that we need to understand and respond to in the present moment. And so to do that tonight, I'm going to explore uh, the following questions. The what of democracy, the who of democracy, and then the when. Uh, of democracy. I think by exploring those questions, we can advance our discussion. So let me start with, with one. Well, you can see the problem of what is democracy almost immediately when you try to answer the question of when. When exactly do countries become minimally democratic? Um, I mean, it's not easy. You know, we look at the restoration of democracy in Germany after World War II or, uh, or 
or Italy. Um, uh, you know, that's the low-hanging fruit. Those ones are, yeah, okay, that's the moment. Um, it's harder when we turn to countries like the United Kingdom, uh, the United States, and Canada. You know, when did they cross the line? When did this, okay, now we're not democracy, oops, now we're democracy. When did that happen? What exactly um, was, the, was the moment? How do we answer that question? And um, the answer to how do we answer that question is that, of course, most people don't bother. They don't answer that question. They just sort of leave it there. Um, and instead, what we get, particularly from political scientists, is what I call a presentist view. Political scientists basically say, hey, what's going on around the world? There's a bunch of countries. They're all calling themselves democratic. Okay, cool. Um, and, you know, what do they look like? Well, we'll just, you know, we'll look at them. We'll make a topology. Groovy. Stick that in a book somewhere. We're on our way. Um, that's, that's not really getting at the questions that I've put before you. Um, this is what we would call an ideal type approach to defining uh, democracy. And there are a number of different strategies. <coughs> Excuse me. Got to quit smoking. Um, there are a number of different uh, strategies that we see people take up in this ideal type approach. So in one, they talk about values. And they say, uh, okay, well, you know, uh, democracy comes from values. Um, you know, people kind of sit around and they say, gosh, I'd like to be democratic, and then somehow they become democratic. Um, another way is to look at institutions and processes and define the presence or absence of those institutions as, as democratic. So you've got some elections going on, good, you're democratic. Um, got some responsible government, a parliamentariz parliamentarization of the executive, okay, that sounds pretty democratic. Um, or uh, we see a focus on scale. Right? Uh, it would have been awful nice to have the village get together and make all the decisions, but, you know, gosh, we're countries now, uh, so we can't do that, so we'll have to have representative forms. And, of course, you know, critics on the left might say, no, 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 that's not democracy. Democracy has to be at the local level. So you can see here the kind of, you know, familiar, this is familiar to you, these kind of ways of talking about democracy. But all of these approaches can be shown to be false, or at best partial. Um, in terms of trying to explain, you know, democracy. I mean, elections. Elections precede the democratic era by a number of centuries. Um, you know, control over the executive um, sounds democratic, but, you know, almost all 19th century countries um, vacillated between either not having any control over the executive or having control over the executive. Um, you know, Germany, no control over the executive. Uh, Britain, control over the executive. Neither of these countries were democratic. Um, you know, in many cases because the electorate was either very small, in the case of the United Kingdom, or because the electorate had no, no, no impact over what the government did. So it's not enough to look at the institutions. Um, we, we, there's something more that we need to, we need to look at. Now, this, these problems lead some political scientists to throw up their hands and say, well, you know what, Demo we can't agree on what democracy is. There's lots of different views. Who am I to say what, what the truth is? So democracy then is an essentially contested concept for these uh, scholars. Well, I'm not prepared to accept that. I think we can actually um, define democracy. It's not that hard, actually. Um, democracy is really a distinctive form of social power. I mean, let's take the ancient Greeks. They, they take a lot of stick, you know. A lot of people are critical of them. They had some democracy going on, and you know, a lot of people think that it wasn't so great. Not everybody was included. Um, okay, fine. I mean, I, I hear the criticisms. It wasn't perfect from our contemporary perspective. But a question needs to be raised. Why did the example of ancient Greek democracy last for centuries? Why did it continue to be feared by the powerful and lauded by the powerless? It wasn't because of its scale. It wasn't because it was just local. Um, it, it certainly um, wasn't because of its processes, like you know, the kind of way in which they would elect people by law rather than by voting. It, is sustained, it was sustained as a, a, a threat or a promise because even within limits from our modern perspective, Greek democracy represented a significant shift in social power, one that placed serious limits on traditional rules. I mean, that's why all the surviving Greek writers hated it. Right? I mean, they, they, I mean it, it crimped their style. You know, they couldn't do just anything they wanted to, which is what they did before. Um, now, you may not think that what the Greeks did was good enough uh, democratically, but what's important is the threat their example represented to succeeding generations. It did lead to a significant shift in social power in ancient Greece, and that's why it was so um, resisted by the powerful, of course, who don't like to be limited. So democracy then, put simply, is about people having the power to influence the decisions that affect their own lives. 
Democracy is not institutions, it's not processes, it's a relational concept. Democracy is a kind of relationship amongst people for their own collective self-governance. Institutions, processes, scales, these aren't democracies, they're only ever a means to democratic ends. Instead, democracy must be judged substantively by whether the great mass of people really do have any power to influence the decisions that affect their own lives. So with that definition of democracy, what about the who? How do we get to democracy? How do we establish this relationship that I've talked about? Well, the first thing we need to do is clear, clear the space of all the false friends that are often credited with bringing about democracy, particularly in the 19th century, but did not, in fact, bring about democracy. And here I'm thinking about things like bourgeois revolutions, uh, the process of parliamentarization, uh, various electoral reforms, like uh, you know, increases in the franchise, um, uh, voting rights, uh, changes to election rules, um, and, of course, uh, ideological programs like liberalism. I'm not suggesting that any of these things weren't or couldn't necessarily be part of a demo democratizing process. It's just that they weren't. I mean, if we go back and actually look, if we take history seriously, if we go back and look at the actors, they're often refreshingly frank uh, about their anti-democratic ideas. Uh, I mean, I, I always find it quite shocking how Canadian political scientists can just blithely talk about Canada established in 1867 as a democracy, except that none of the founders would actually agree with that characterization. I mean, you never got a more clear bunch of folks. I mean, they just were absolutely, they had a big hate on for democracy and weren't very afraid to share it um, a lot. Um, and yet somehow this statement of not being interested in democracy is ignored or, or somehow overlooked. The actual democratic actors in the 19th century were the working class, organized into the political left. As Goran Fairborn noted long ago, the openings for democracy came out of the contradictions of capitalism. Uh, a new economic system that created a new class of people, the working class, and out of the contradictions that emerged from the conditions that they faced, conditions that contributed to division, but also potential unity, given their common exploitation. But there's nothing automatic about that process. Democratic results were the product of historical contingency, as well as the development of more structural factors. And so here we have to take seriously agency, there were three key strategies that the working class deployed in struggling for democracy. Spectacles of opposition, uh, the development of permanent organizations of and by the working class, and the development of a radical equalitarian agenda for social change. Spectacles of opposition were things like occupations, one-day strikes, um, factory occupations, um, things that signaled to others that uh, we're not very happy with this and we'd like to see a change. Um, that is crucially important, it's important then, it's important today. Um, but permanent organizations of the working class were also crucial. So unions, uh, political parties, these were crucial organizations for taking that great mass of people and wielding them into a political force. But it wasn't enough to have organizations or spectacles, you needed something, some kind of democratic imaginary, something that resonated with people. And so the development of um, uh, where was I here? An equalitarian agenda for social change was absolutely crucial. But as Gordon Fairborn noted, sheer will wasn't enough. Unpredictable historical events, class divisions, all of these things were crucial, class divisions, particularly amongst the upper class, um, were crucially important in terms of these breakthroughs, which of course were nowhere the same. I mean, that's what's interesting about history is that um, nowhere were the transitions to actually existing democracy um, the same. Um, they differed uh, in all different locations because history matters. So this brings us to when. In most Western countries, the breakthrough comes during or just after World War I, much later than most people realize. And the key thing to understand is that actually existing democracy, the actually existing democracy that was achieved was a compromise between two forces who actually wanted something else. On the one hand, the right didn't want democracy, but they couldn't resist conceding something in the context of World War I. And the left, of course, wanted a more robust and substantive understanding and accomplishment of democracy, but they couldn't force that through either because they weren't powerful enough. So what we end up with from the struggle is this actually existing democracy, this combination of, of, con of, of, of competition and conflict between left and right. 
And the struggle continued after that point, um, uh, by the right to weaken the already existing democracy and by the left to strengthen it. Now, this point that I'm making shouldn't be that shocking to anyone. I mean, especially anybody who's paid attention to the interwar period, because we can see this struggle carrying on between World War I and World War II. Where the right could, they got rid of democracy. So places like Italy, Germany, and Spain. But elsewhere, they just blocked left attempts to further democracy, particularly on economic issues uh, during the Depression. And I was just rereading William L. Shearer's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Not an unproblematic book, uh, there are lots of issues with it, but what comes through so strongly in Shearer's very political account of the rise of Nazism is the absolute hatred of the German ruling class to any opening to democracy. And despite establishing the institutional parameters of what appears to be a democratic state, they continue to fight from within the state and outside the state to dismantle and destroy um, that accomplishment. And they, of course, are completely successful in the 1930s. Now, the post-war period is more complicated. Here, the left uh, was key to the post-war concessions in Western countries uh, well, in terms of things like the welfare state and labor laws. But we don't want to push that too far because regulated trade amid post-war rebuilding efforts and the broader context of international superpower competition was obviously also important in stabilizing the post-war regime. This post-war consensus around so-called liberal democracy was really my timer there, um, was really a temporary standoff, as we've come to discover over time. Anti-democratic right forces were temporarily sidelined after World War II, but never completely absent, as we can see with the continuing influence of people like Hayek, Goldwater, Friedman, and they, of course, gained more traction as we move into the 1970s. Meanwhile, the working class is increasingly demobilized from the 1970s on. Let me conclude. Our present democracy is actually existing democracy, the product of a clash between democratic and anti-democratic forces. This may seem obvious, but it's actually an important point to make, because conventional discussion talks about democracy as if it's accomplished and everybody agrees with it. And that's just not the case if we look at this question historically. The lesson that we need to remind ourselves of now is that the right never really resigned itself to democracy, and it's consistently sought to limit and or get rid of it if they could. That's what we see going on in places like Hungary and Poland right now in the most naked way. So the present moment is not post-democracy or undoing democracy. That gives too much credit to what actually existing democracy ever was. Concretely or substantively, it, it never really was that democratic. But in saying that, it was the realization. It was the accomplishment of democratic forces. So I don't want to take that away from them. And that, those democratic forces were the working class organized into the political left. What we're seeing today is the consistent behavior of conservatives and liberals in protecting and advancing their own interests. They were never the vanguard of democracy, so they won't be its protectors now. Indeed, left to themselves and their self-interest, they'll probably destroy us all. As we can see going on blatantly in places like Hungary and Poland, but less so in the United Kingdom, USA, and Canada, but still going on. The only force that has ever stood against such tyranny is an organized working class and figuring out how to mobilize the great mass of people who need democracy into the battle to gain it and sustain it is our most pressing need. Thank you.